The other night I talked on the topic of being unburdensome. One of the principles that the Buddha taught to his stepmother, Baba Japati Gotami. I'd like to say some more on the topic tonight, because the other night he just skimmed over the topic. There's a lot of misunderstanding of what it means to be unburdensome. You have to put it in context. Remember that the goal of the path is dispassion. And so there are types of being unburdensome that are conducive to dispassion, and others that are not. That's the deciding factor. There's a story in the canon, one of the origin stories for the rule against storing of food. There was an arahant, his name was Balatasisa. He was Ananda's preceptor. The commentary says that he was the leader of the Kasapa brothers, the thousand fire-worshipping ascetics. He lived alone in the forest, and he'd go for alms only about once a week. He'd get rice and get the rice for today, and then the remaining rice in his bowl that he didn't eat today, he would set out in the sun, he'd dry it, and then on later days he would moisten it and have a little more rice. And it was very frugal. Word of this got to the Buddha, and the Buddha said, this is not inspiring. This is not to be done. One of those rare cases in which an arahant was the, the reason for a rule is being promulgated. And the Buddha doesn't tell his reason there, reasoning there, <clears throat> but he does talk in other places about how important it is that we have a monastic community where people are provided in ways, in terms of food, clothing, shelter, and medicine, so that they can devote themselves fully to the practice. This way you have full-time practitioners permeating society, where they can share their wisdom, share their example. And it's in the context of this mutual dependence between the monastics and the lay people. that we have the opportunity to, if we have time to practice fully, and if we don't have time to practice fully, at least we're near people who do. Because there are ways in which you could think about the monks being totally unburdensome by just going off in the forest and growing their own food, taking care of themselves, and not having to depend on anybody, and that would be unburdensome in one way. But it would deprive the lay people of the opportunity to be near people who are devoted to the practice, and it would deprive the monks of the opportunity to be good examples to other people, and to have opportunities for exerting their compassion. Remember that chant we have, those who show respect and welcoming guests are near Nibbana. So the Buddha is not encouraging people to be misanthropes, just trying to run away from society. You have time to be alone, but you also have time to be respectful when people come to you with, with requests. So there's a back and forth, and it's in the context of this back and forth that dispassion can be developed in the proper way. Recently I was reading a statement by a lay Dharma teacher that it's not convenient to have monks who don't handle money. I guess if you invite them to your house, then you have to take them to the airport. You can't depend on them to take themselves to the airport. And so this teacher wanted to have the rule rescinded for her own convenience, I guess. Well, she's not the first to make this complaint. Back in Thailand, where we stayed at Wat Dhamma Sita, the lay people in the area were mainly Mahanikai types. In other words, the men, when they were younger and had ordained had ordained at Mahanikai monasteries, where they handled money. They are making the complaint that the forest monks, in not handling money, were making themselves burdensome. You need to have somebody to hand carry your money for you when you went anywhere. But again, the Buddha said that if you allow people to handle money, if you allow the monks to handle money, they can 
take on all kinds of unskillful things with the money. So that would be a way of being unburdensome that would not be conducive to dispassion. It's like cases of monks storing up food on, for themselves. Blood at Sea Sauce, as an example, was one of us doing that out of frugality, but there are lots of other people who could store up food for reasons that were not frugal at all. And you see this in the big Buddhist universities that developed in India. The monks were storing up food. And so when the universities were wiped out, because there had been no sense of connection between the monks and the local lay people, the monks had their own food, the lay people had their own food. The monks were getting their sponsorship from kings and other people like that. When the universities were wrapped up, people didn't see much need to reinstate them, because they weren't getting anything out of them in terms of their daily spiritual needs. So when I talk about being unburdensome, you have to realize it's in the context of being unburdensome in ways that are conducive to dispassion and those that are conducive to passion, which is why we have the rules as they are. For example, the rules about building lodgings. If people have not offered material things, you don't ask for material things. You can ask for them to run errands and to do little jobs here and there, which they don't have to pay money for, or they don't have to spend money for. Even there, though, you have to have a sense of how much is enough and how much is too much. And the Buddha is constantly reminding the monks, don't make yourself a nuisance with your requests. He gives a fine story about a monk who was living out in the forest. It was near a large marsh. And the birds would come and settle in the marsh every night, and they would just chatter all night long. And the forest otherwise was an ideal place to practice, but it was just the sound of the birds was driving him crazy. So I came to see the Buddha, and I said, what can I do? And the Buddha said, well, in the beginning of the night, stand up and make this announcement. All of you birds here, I want a f feather from each of the birds. And then in the second watch, and the third watch, make the announcement. So the monk did. And the birds said, oh, this monk is asking for too much, and so they all left. As the Buddha said, even common animals don't like being re pestered with requests. How much more human beings? So you have a sense of being able to read people when you get it, so you can know it when you've reached the point of enough and you're about to overstep the boundaries of too much. It's always good to Stay away from that boundary. But when you sense it coming, okay, then you can pull back. Now these principles don't apply only to monks. They apply to lay people too. The requests that lay people have for others may not have to do with only with asking for help with the project. Of all the other ways in which we ask for help for other people. You have to have a sense of when are you asking too much. Learn how to read other people. And if you want something out of them and you begin to gain the sense that they're beginning to give the signs that you're asking for too much, don't get upset. Don't say, well, there's something wrong with them. Just realize, okay, this is, this is their boundary. They're not here to serve my needs. And you pull back. So obviously this requires a lot of sensitivity, but that's what we're here for, to learn to be sensitive and learn to be sensitive to the right things. You've got to be sensitive to how you're creating your own suffering. And it's going to be in areas where you're very much attached. I mean, by definition, it's your attachments. And those are areas where we tend to be very insensitive to where we're being burdensome and insensitive to where our attachments are inappropriate.
to open your mind to this possibility that where you're most dearly attached and you have the strongest feelings about how right it is to be attached there, that's precisely where you've got to question things. And you've got to see that there's suffering there. Without seeing the suffering, it's very hard to admit that you're doing something that's unskillful. We all tend to live in our worlds, our own ideas of what's right and what's wrong. And the only reasons that we're willing to listen to other people is because there's areas where we know that we're lacking something. Something's not quite right in the way we're doing things. If you're fully convinced that what you're doing is right, then other people can have the best reasons in the world and they're just not going to penetrate. This is why the Buddha says you want to be sensitive to where there's stress and suffering and it's being caused by you, by your actions. Because only then are you willing to look for outside help. Remember the Buddha's description of the normal reaction to suffering or pain. One is bewilderment, and the second is, is there somebody out there who knows how to put a way, knows a way or two to put an end to this pain? It's because of our pain, because of our suffering and stress. That's why we look to help to others for help. So in this case, when you see the stress and suffering you're causing, that's when the mind will be open to listen to what the Buddha has to say about how to put an end to it. And he's saying, look at the areas where you're most attached. The areas where you can have the most justifications for your attachments. Right there is where you're causing yourself suffering. But as I said, because we're so attached there, we don't tend to see the burdens that those things are placing on other people and the burdens they're placing on us. As far as we're concerned, it's the way things got to be. And it's a good step in the right direction when you realize that, to put it in plain language, they don't got to be that way. <laughs>